Well, we're still praying about the um, Song of Solomon. If, um, if I'm sure if you really want to understand that book, one thing you have to understand is that um, David, in uh, the Old Testament account, tends to represent Christ in his first coming. And uh, Solomon tends to represent Christ at his second coming. Now, when we say that, you mustn't uh, assume that uh, everything that David did must be Christ-like, nor that everything that Solomon did must be Christ-like, because no single human being, of course, could fully typify the Lord Jesus Christ. But if you've got considerable reading time uh, in the next week or so, and you'll start, and if you'll start somewhere about the middle of First Samuel, and read into the first few chapters of First Kings, and if you'll look closely, you'll see many similarities uh, between the person and ministry of David uh, and that of Christ in his office as a shepherd. And um, then you'll see, uh, you'll see some parallels in the relationship of the two, that is David and Solomon, and also in Solomon. You'll see uh, representatives um, uh, representative things in his life. He, to give you something to think about, there's an Old Testament individual uh, that you'll get, you'll find uh, as you get about the middle of the book of Second Samuel. His name is Shimei, and uh, you may remember that he's the one that uh, that mocked David threw stones and hurled vindictive at him. And uh, when David was coming back across the river, he repented, and David fully received him. And uh, although he'd sinned considerably against David, but when he did one thing, just one thing in defiance of Solomon, immediately he was cut off from the land of the living. And uh, this shows the difference between Jesus Christ uh, mercifully forgiving and Jesus Christ uh, who will rule one day with a rod of iron. And uh, so um, this is just one of the indications that will help you to understand that, uh, that difference in type. And if you're going to understand the the Song of Solomon, Solomon. You must uh, you must understand uh, that um, Christ is typified in this way. But we want to do something else tonight. You know, our real job on this earth is to uh, deliver the gospel message. And in any Bible study group, you need to talk about that occasionally, uh, at least occasionally. I see so much uh, that tends to come short of the biblical description of the gospel. I mean, it's termed the gospel. Uh, most all of our evangelizing organizations have these uh, formulas or uh, steps to go by or uh, uh, routes to travel or whatever. Uh, I don't mean to discredit one or the other. But uh, you've seen them in uh, Campus Crusade use one, Word of Life uses one, uh, Billy Graham Evangelistic uh, Association uses one, the Christian businessmen use one. And I can't understand, if they're going to take a track to run on, why they don't clearly present what the Bible defines as the gospel in those, uh, in those tracks. Uh, or in those uh, systems that we go by. Now, I trust that, that when we finish with our Bible study tonight, you can clearly see 
uh, I mean, clearly understand just what the gospel message is, and then when you have occasion, measure it. Just measure it for uh, uh, all of its um, components with uh, some of these steps, uh, easy soul winning steps, so to speak. I fear what we've done, we've learned from experience how to put words and thoughts so that people will give a favorable response and so that we can get a relatively high degree of, uh, of yeses, and, uh, uh, which may be a relatively low degree. Uh, the uh, CBMC uses uh, one of these. It's called Four Steps to Peace with God. Uh, it's very similar to some of the like four spiritual laws and some of the others. But, uh, and, and they've used it uh, with uh, a great uh, degree of success as far as getting people to, to come. And so the Atlanta Christian Businessmen's Committee decided they wanted to do a little research and follow-up. And they had carefully cataloged the, uh, the names and the addresses of the people that had responded to this uh, outreach uh, track. Uh, by track, I mean a T-R-A-C-K, a track to run on. Uh, and uh, they, uh, they got a group of businessmen from all over the country together to have a, uh, a one-week blitz in Atlanta, and the whole idea was to call back on everybody that had signed the decision uh, within the past two years, everybody they could. And they actually made a face-to-face -face confrontation with more than 60 percent of those. And uh, they were startled to find that it was only in maybe, I, I forgot the exact figure, but it was way less than 10 percent of those who signed and said, yes, I receive Christ as my Savior, who at that time gave any indication whatsoever that there was any change in their life. And uh, so what is the matter? Um, I have a very good friend that, that has been quite active in, uh, in Campus Crusade. And uh, his, uh, I say, well, he tells me about all the people, you know, that say yes. And, and if I question at all about, well, just how effective is it in the long run? And, uh, and he says, well, that's not for us to, uh, to be concerned about. He says, uh, it's our job to deliver the message and leave the rest up to God. And that's, uh, that's we fulfill our responsibility. Well, I might possibly go along with that if I was absolutely sure that the message was being delivered, and that's what we want to talk about. First place, let's look in Romans chapter 1. Did you ever think about the book of Romans in this, these terms? The book of Romans is the explanation of the gospel to a saved person. You know, the gospel is to be proclaimed to unsaved people, and it should be carefully explained to saved people. You ever think about that? Sometimes we get it the other way around. Uh, there's some churches where the gospel is proclaimed to a group of saved people every Sunday night. And uh, uh, it's uh, occasionally uh, explained to the man on the street. It's to be, compl it's, it's to be uh, proclaimed to the unsaved and explained to the saved. And that's exactly what the book of Roman do Romans does. It explains the gospel to a saved person. We need to understand it, all the intricacies of the gospel. And it's, uh, it's not always profitable to attempt to explain it to an unsaved person. Now, why can we say this? Look at Romans. By the way, I may even spend two weeks on this if I uh, get uh, uh, overly excited about it, so uh, uh, get, get prepared. Romans chapter 1, verse 16, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ for it. Now, uh, what is the antecedent for the pronoun it? That's, that's a good, huh? 
the gospel, isn't it? See, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth. Now, if the gospel is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, then we ought to attempt to find out just exactly what is the gospel. A few weeks ago, I was invited to be the principal speaker at a retreat. And uh, as near as I could determine, the people that went there were saved people. They all attended fundamental gospel-believing churches, and it was not an outreach type of a meeting. And so the first thing I did was to try to find out if they could define the gospel. And I even tried to give a clue by saying, how does the Bible define the gospel? What is the gospel according to the Bible de definition? And I want to tell you, I got a lot of definitions, and I didn't get one single precise definition of the gospel. It's uh, what God says. And it is. It's uh, that Christ died for our sins, and it is. But neither of those come anywhere near uh, the, gospel, the, the scriptural definition of the gospel. And uh, uh, some even said, uh, well, it's the gospel is uh, everything that God says, or the gospel is the Bible. And then, of course, some said, uh, defining the word, it's good news. Uh, well, that, that is defining the word all right. It, it means good news. But uh, we didn't have a scriptural definition. Before we go to that, I want us to be sure that we need to do more than simply proclaim the gospel even if we know exactly what it is. Now, we can see that in 1 Thessalonians chapter 1. Now, if you think I'm, I'm attempting to make this too complicated, remember, I said the gospel should be explained to save people, and it should be proclaimed. I didn't say you're supposed to explain it to unsaved people. So if you think, uh, you think that I'm going to get too technical or too complicated, well, just remember, uh, we're saved people, and we should, uh, we should know all of the intricacies of, uh, of any subject of God. You say, is the gospel, all of that, complicated? Well, it must be, because there sure are very few that can define it in a scriptural manner with you, uh, for you. But the next thing we want to uh, make sure is that we understand that just because the gospel is proclaimed is no assurance that God will choose to use it to save souls. Let's read what uh, uh, the Apostle Paul said to the Thessalonians. He says in verse 2, We give thanks to God always for you. Well, no. He says, We give thanks to God always for you all. You, you may not have realized this, but the Apostle Paul was from southern Asia Minor, <laughs> right on the south coast, uh, uh, there on the, on the uh, Mediterranean Sea. So we give thanks to God always for you all, or y'all if you prefer, making mention of you in our prayers, <coughs> remembering without ceasing your work of faith and labor of love and patience of hope. Faith, hope, faith, love, and hope. In our Lord Jesus Christ, in the sight of God our Father, knowing, brethren, beloved, your election of God. Now, what is Paul saying when he says, knowing, brethren, beloved, your election of God? What he's saying is this, I know you folks are saved. That's what he's saying. He says, I am absolutely confident that you are among the elect. Well, how could Paul be so confident? How could he know? I don't think many of us could make that type of a statement to the average church we know. We couldn't 
say, I know all the people in that church are saved. But that's what Paul is saying. When he says, knowing, bre brethren, beloved, your election of God. Now, here's how he knew they were saved. Verse 5, he said, For our gospel came not unto you in word only. Now, there is such a thing as the true gospel coming in word only. And Paul uh, says, receiving the gospel under that circumstance is receiving it in vain. For our gospel came not unto you in word only, but also, something additional besides in word only, also in power and in the Holy Ghost and in much assurance. He's, and then he gives the reasons why. As ye know what manner of men we were among you for your sakes. God chooses whether he wants to honor the vessel along with the message. You see, the gospel is designed to be delivered by human agency. And God chooses whether or not he is going to empower that message. Now, as we go on here in this, um, in this uh, uh, first epistle to the Thessalonians, Paul makes it quite clear what the qualifications are if you want to really be sure that you delivered the gospel in power. Uh, look at some of the qualifications. Well, there, it's all through these first two chapters, but I'll pick out some. Look in verse 7 of chapter 2. But we were gentle among you, even as a nurse cherishes her children. So being affectionately desirous of you, we were willing to have imparted in unto you not the gospel of God only, but also our own souls, because you were dear to us. For you remember, brethren, our labor and travail, for laboring night and day, because we would not be chargeable unto any of you, we preached unto you the gospel of God. I believe Paul knew what the gospel was. He was sure that he proclaimed the gospel. Verse 10, you are witnesses, and God also, how holily and justly and unblameably we behaved ourselves among you that believe. As you know, how we exhorted and comforted and charged every one of you as a father does his children that you would walk worthy of God who had called you unto his He didn't just, you see, put out a message. Some of us think that uh, the key is to come back six or eight weeks later and, you know, do a little follow-up thing. Paul only saw these people two to three weeks, at the very most three weeks, less than three weeks, and he was run out of town. But he, he didn't just deliver the gospel message, but he also showed them how to walk worthy. Verse 13, For this cause we also thank we God without ceasing, because when you received the word of God, which you heard of us, you received it, not as the word of men, but as it is in truth the word of God, which effectively worketh also in you that believe. That is to say, the word of God works effectively in you that have already believed. That's what the, the apostle Peter said in his first epistle. He says, being born again by the word of God, and then he says, desire the sincere milk of the word that ye may grow thereby. Uh, so, uh, it, it, Paul's saying the same thing. He said that uh, the word of God, the gospel is the word of God, and that which works in you effectively after you're saved is the word of God. Both. Now that we, now that we see that the gospel is the power of God under salvation, and now that we see that it's important that the gospel come not in word only, then... 
we're, we're ready now to see then what is the gospel. And of course, it's divine, defined for us very carefully in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Now, it's no accident that the definition of the gospel is in the chapter known as the resurrection chapter because the true gospel message heavily stresses the, res uh, the resurrection. And most of these patterns that we are taught to follow to present the gospel either don't mention it at all or just barely mention it. So what the people really think when you're offering them a more abundant life, they're thinking in terms of that which, which is between now and the grave. They really, really never get uh, the thought in their minds that we're talking about uh, a power that will take you through the grave. And this takes an effective uh, delivery of of the truth of the resurrection. The Bible never leaves Jesus Christ on the cross. The Bible never mentions his crucifixion except that it loudly proclaims that he rose from the dead in power. All right, so the gospel is defined in the resurrection chapter, and we'll see why that makes sense. Okay, 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Verse 1, Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel. Remember I said the gospel is to be declared. That means spoken forth. Uh, Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached or proclaimed. Uh, the word preach has a slightly different or a considerable diff considerably different connotation to us now than it had when these words were were translated into the English language. If we would, uh, if we'd let it just mean proclaim or speak forth, uh, we're not speaking here about uh, uh, what's supposed to happen in a pulpit necessarily. Uh, we're not uh, uh, talking what would uh, be confined to uh, uh, the message of. Uh, what they call in the seminaries the preacher boys. Uh, the, uh, it means to speak forth. He says, Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which also you have received, and in which ye stand, by which also you are saved. So this is telling us some things about the government. I mean, the gospel. The gospel is something that saves, it's something in which you can stand, it's to be declared, and it's to be received. Uh, second verse again, by which also uh, you're saved, if you keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless you have believed in vain. See, there is such a thing as believing in vain, or uh, believing uh, in a useless manner or a futile manner. You know, uh, in this 15th chapter, the word vain, V-A-I-N, the English word vain, is used four times. And uh, it's used four times. And it's the translation of three separate Greek words. This, in the second verse here, uh, I gave the wrong one, if you took notes. Uh, this one means uh, to no purpose. It just means you believe to no purpose. It, it didn't, it didn't uh, uh, amount to anything. In verse 10, the word vain means fruitless, void of fruit. In verse 14, it means empty. And in verse 17, useless or futile. Uh, four times in this one chapter you have the English word vain, uh, translation of three separate Greek words. Anyway, we're in verse 3 now of chapter 15. For I delivered unto you first of all that which I also received. Now, see the word received and then there's a comma? 
Well, beginning with that comma, you're going to have God's definition of the gospel. See, let's look at that first half. It be God's definition of the gospel begins in the middle of the third verse and runs through the fourth verse. So let's look again at the first half of the third verse. For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I have also received. Notice that when the gospel is received, then it's supposed to be delivered. That's how you got it. You received it from somebody that delivered it. Now you're supposed to deliver it to somebody else. It's an item that's to be received and delivered. And God's definition of the gospel is in the last half of verse 3 and the entire verse 4. And here it is, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that he was buried and that he rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. Did you know that most of the people that are, quote, witnesses for the Lord can't tell you one Scripture that promised the resurrection? I mean, not even one. And the Bible says that the gospel is that Christ rose again according to the Scriptures. Here's the message. God said it was going to happen, and then it happened exactly like God said it would happen, and that puts the power in it. It didn't happen, and then God told us about it. After that, God said spelled it out in no uncertain terms how it was going to happen, and then it happened. And when we proclaim the gospel to people, we need to say, look, God said something was going to happen, and then it happened just like he said it would happen. What was that hap that happened? That Jesus Christ died for our sin exactly in accordance with how God said he would die for our sin. And then after he was buried, he rose again. But it's not just that he rose again, but God said he was going to rise again, again. And he gave all the details. And then when it happened, it happened in exact accordance to that. Now that puts the power in the gospel. And that's what's lacking in all of these tracks to run out. On. They don't even mention the fact that God said it before it happened. And you see, only God can do that. And that kind of a gospel has to be accepted or rejected, because only God can do that. Now, I suppose most of us that have been to Sunday school at all could name a number of chapters in the Old Testament that spoke of the death of Christ, couldn't we? That Christ would die. And over and over again, when Jesus was here on earth, he says that the scriptures might be fulfilled. He says, I'll be delivered up and rise again the third day, that the scriptures might be fulfilled. But how many of us can point to the scriptures in the Old Testament that tell of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. In February, I was invited to um, do a series of Bible studies in Orangeburg, uh, South Carolina. We used to go up there uh, a couple of times every year and have a, a whole weekend series. And the people, when they found out they weren't getting the, the true word in their churches, they uh, they organized a new church, and uh, it's a, it's a big church now, it has a Christian school and everything, and uh, but they they got a a pastor that uh, didn't choose to invite me anymore. And finally, they got rid of that one, got the old one back. Now I've been invited again. So uh, I was up there, and um, they really work you. I spoke six times, and from Friday night through Sunday night, and uh, all six messages were the resurrection in the Old Testament. And we didn't even come close to running out of material. 
six Bible lessons on the resurrection in the Old Testament. And the, the pitiful plight of most Christians is he couldn't even think of one place in the Old Testament that mentions the resurrection. So how in the world could he possibly proclaim the gospel? Now, when he's proclaiming the gospel, he doesn't have to go back and, and go through all of those. That's what the, Peter did when he preached his first sermon that we're going to see here in a minute. But, uh, but at least the hearer needs to be told that God said that it was going to happen that way before it happened that way. You see, when, when the gospel is, is presented that way in power, it will either be received or it will infuriate the, the, the hearer. Uh, you see, he must either agree or say there is no God or say that, uh, that uh, uh, nobody knows what God said. He must discredit God in order to deny a message like that. And listen, if you put it like that, you won't get near as many yeses. In fact is, you'll make a lot more enemy. You see, the idea now is to present the message in such a way that even if the fellow doesn't say yes, he's still your friend. Uh, above all, don't let the person get offended. Well, back in the day of the Lord Jesus Christ and the day of the Apostle Paul, when the gospel was presented in the power of the Spirit, a lot of people got offended. Uh, and, uh, but you see, when it was presented by the most able presenters that ever lived, like the Apostle Paul, for instance, most people rejected it. And so what we do, we found out how to dress it up in a, a chain of thought, you know, uh, we learned enough about the psychology of the matter. You, you know, we're, we're a nation of salesmen in a lot of ways. And uh, we spend a lot of our time trying to figure out how to say things so that you get the listener to follow along with you. That's all of you, you know, your TV advertising or billboard advertising or whatever. It's a science. How do you put it forth so that you can get the guy to do this instead of this, you know. And so we've learned that if you put these things in certain ways, you get a lot more yeses. Now, now that makes us feel better, doesn't it? You don't get so many no's. Um, but uh, I fear that, that that's the trap we've fallen into. We've learned how to formulate formulas which bring smiles and bring uh, acquiescence. You know, I never am satisfied with my presentation of the gospel and the reaction has till I see some great big old wet tears rolling down the cheek. And that encouraged me to think the guy might have got saved. And I really look for those tears. And boy, I, my old heart begins to jumping when, and pumping when I when I see some tears trickle down. But you know, uh, I know I've been on these, you know, campaigns and all. And they come back and tell about, you know, all the people. And uh, nobody saw any tears. Well, I tell you, the tears came when I got saved. I don't, I, tears didn't save anybody, you know. But I've learned from experience that it's one of the, evidences in many cases that something happened down in the heart. Uh, well, how about this matter? What does it mean that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures and that he was buried and that he rose again the third day according to the Scriptures? It has to mean that the Old Testament told how it was going to be. Doesn't it have to mean that? because the scriptures here means the holy writing. The gospel is that it was according to the scriptures that he died. 
and it was according to the scriptures that he rose again. Now let's watch somebody present the gospel for us, and we'll see how it's presented, and then we'll see what the reaction was. Let's turn to the, the second chapter of the book of Acts, and uh, we'll let uh, Peter do it for us this time. And uh, this is not a very long sermon. But I'll tell you what, he sure did tell them that Christ died and rose again according to the Scriptures. He told them that. And I want you to notice how much more emphasis there is in this message on the resurrection than there is on the death. I, I'll assure you that a hundred percent, at least the ones I've seen, of these formulas that you use, uh, the death of Christ is much more prominent than his resurrection. Let's see how Peter did it. Now, Peter is going to start speaking in verse 14 of Acts chapter 2. But from 14 through 21, he's just trying to explain to the hearer what's going on. And he doesn't start presenting his gospel message till he gets in verse 22. And he preaches from verse 22 through verse 36. That's not a very long sermon, but 3,000 people got saved, and he got put in jail. Uh, preached a couple more times, and all kind of things happened to him. But a lot of people got saved. Now, let's just see what he says. Acts chapter 2, verse 22. You men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man... Now, I like to, uh, it's great to make sure the people understand that he's God, but it was a man that died on Calvary's cross, and it's a man that's in the glories now. It's a fellow human being that came out of that grave. Ye men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man approved of God among you by miracles and wonders and signs which God did by him in the midst of you, as you yourselves also know, him being delivered by the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God. See, he's starting right there to tell you that God knew all about it, and he, it happened according to God's plan. See, he, he wants to be sure that these hearers understand that, that God planned it all. Him being delivered by the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God ye have taken, and by wicked hands have crucified and slain. He didn't mind pointing out their specific sin either, did he? This is another thing these little formulas uh, usually fail to do. They fail to put their finger on sin. Now, I know, you know, we've all sinned, you know, that type of thing. But, I mean, Peter told them how they sinned, didn't he? How about when Jesus witnessed to Nicodemus? How about when Jesus witnessed to the woman at the well? Thou sayest well, says, uh, for you've been married five times, and the one that you have now is not your husband. Uh, he didn't mind pointing out her sin. He got saved, too. Ye have taken by wicked hands and have crucified and slain. Uh-oh, Peter put Christ on the cross, didn't he? What did he do with him when he put him on the cross? Verse 24, Whom God hath raised up, having loosed the pains of death, because it was not possible that he should be holding by it, that, that death would hold him, the grave would hold him. That's not possible. Uh, then you know what he's going to do? He's going to give an, he's going to tell that God told about that resurrection. He's going to tell you where in the Old Testament you can find out something about the resurrection, because from verses 25 to verse, through verses 28, He's going to tell what was said in the psalm, and what was said in that psalm is that Jesus would be raised from the dead. And 
that the resurrection of Christ was according to that scripture. Now, that's not the only... But notice how he gets right into it. He wants to be sure that his hearers know that God said it before it happened. For David speaketh concerning him, say, I foresaw the Lord always before my face, for he is on my right hand, that I should not be moved. Therefore did my heart rejoice, and my tongue was glad. Moreover, my flesh also shall rest in hope, because thou wilt not leave my soul in hell, or Hades, the place of the departed dead, that is. Neither wilt thou suffer thine holy one to see corruption. Thou hast made known to me the ways of life. Thou shalt make me uh, full of joy and uh, with thy countenance. Now look, in, Peter's going to explain it in verse 29. Men and brethren, he says, let us freely speak unto you of the patriarch David, that he's both dead and buried, and his sepulcher is with us unto this day. In other words, he wasn't talking about himself. Therefore, being a prophet, prophet, and knowing that God had sworn with an oath to him that of the fruit of his loins, according to flesh, he would raise up Christ to sit on his throne. Look at that. See, verse 24, raise up. Verse 30, raise up. He's seeing this before. See, God, it's according to the scriptures. God showed it to David before it happened. He's seeing this before, spoke of the resurrection of Christ. Verse 24, raised up. Verse 30, raised up. Verse 31, resurrection. That his soul was not left in Hades, neither his flesh did see corruption. This Jesus has God raised up. Wherefore, we are all witnesses. Therefore, being by the right hand of God exalted and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he has shed forth this which you now see and hear. See, uh, it had been promised by the Holy Spirit. For David is not ascended into the heavens. Now he's going to get to the deity of Christ. David is not descended into heavens, but he said himself. David said himself, The Lord said unto my Lord, Sit thou on my right hand until I make thy foes thy footstool. Therefore, let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God hath made that same Jesus whom ye crucified, both Lord and Christ. According to the scriptures, he said. You see. Now, that's not a long sermon. That's not a long, complicated presentation of the gospel. Verse 37, now when they heard this, they were pricked in their hearts. Look at verse 41. Then they that gladly received his words were baptized, and the same day they were added unto them about 3,000 souls. Now, I, I want to make sure we understand one thing. Peter presented the gospel as the gospel is defined by God in the scriptures. That's what he did. Well, in the third chapter, he's going to do it all over again. And uh, he, in verse 12, and when Peter uh, saw it, he answered the people, ye men of Israel, why marvel ye at this? Or why look ye so earnestly on us as though by our own power or holiness uh, we had made this man walk? The God of Abraham, of Isaac, and of Jacob, the God of our fathers, has glorified his son Jesus, whom he delivered up and denied in the presence of Pilate when he was determined to let him go. But you denied the Holy One and the just and desired a murderer. He's pointing out their sin again. And you killed the Prince of Life, whom God has raised from the dead, of which you are witnesses. And his name, through faith in his name, hath... Uh, hath made this man strong, whom you see and know, uh, yea, the faith which, he's talking about the man that was, was healed. The faith which is by him hath given him this perfect soundness in the presence of you. Look in verse 18, but those things which God before had shown by the mouth of all of his prophets that Christ should suffer, he hath fulfilled. See? that his death was in fulfillment of something that God said beforehand. 
that's the gospel. And to leave out the fact that God said it before it happened is to leave out part of the gospel, the real power part. It's no, it's no great task when we're witnessing to people to tell them that God said it before it happened. And when it happened, it happened like he foretold it would happen. That's what Peter's doing. Very faithfully he's doing that. Verse 18 again, But those things which God before had shown by the mouth of all of his prophets and Christ should suffer, uh, he hath full, so fulfilled, just like he said it. It's according to the scriptures, in other words. Repent, therefore, and be converted, that your sins may be blotted out when the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord, and he shall send Jesus Christ, who before was preached unto you, whom the heavens must receive until the times of restitution, which God hath spoken by the mouth of all of his holy prophets since the world began. For Moses truly said unto the fathers a prophet. You see, he proves it all by the words of God. Look at verse 24. Yea, and all the prophets from Samuel and those that followed after, as many as have spoken, have likewise foretold of these days. What days? These days we've just gone through. How can we miss the fact that the two things that are emphasized when the gospel is presented, number one, that Christ said it, I mean, that God said it beforehand, that it all happened in accordance with the scriptures. Number two, that it consummated in the resurrection from the dead, that there's a man been through the grave and is now in the heavens. There's the power in the gospel. Verse 26 of this chapter 3, Unto you first, God having raised up his son. How we miss the fact that, the, that it's the resurrection that's emphasized in the gospel message. Raised up, raised up, resurrected, raised up. Well, some more people got saved. Look at chapter 4, verse 4. But many of them who heard the word believed, and the number of the men was about 5,000. <coughs> Of course, all of them didn't believe. And um, some of them didn't like it. Peter preached a real short one to the religious leaders. It's in chapter 4, verse 8. Then Peter, filled with the Holy Ghost, said unto them, Ye rulers of the people and elders of Israel, if we this day be examined for the good done to this impotent man, by what means he is made whole, be it known unto you and to all the people of Israel, that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead. And then he goes on and quotes the Old Testament scriptures with which they were familiar with. He says in verse 11, This is the stone which was set at naught by you builders. Now that was one of their favorite scriptures, you know, that uh, taught the importance of the... Uh, nation of Israel in God's program, and that's why Peter would quote that. Well, it wasn't just Peter. Uh, you read that sermon by this fellow, Stephen, in, the, in chapter 7 of Acts, and you'll see he based his whole sermon on the fact that God had said all of these things beforehand, and he tells them verse by verse, exactly what God said. And then uh, then he puts his finger right on their sin, too. Look at verse 51, we're in chapter 7. Ye stiff-necked and uncircumcised in heart and ears, you do always resist the Holy Ghost, as your fathers did, so do you. Which of the prophets have not your fathers persecuted? And they have slain them who showed before of the coming of the just one. See? according to the scriptures. Your fathers have slain the ones that told beforehand the uh, coming of the just one, of whom ye have been now the betrayers and the murderers, 
who have received the law by the dispensation of angels and have not kept it, when they heard these things, they were cut to the heart, and they gnashed on him with their teeth. But he being full of, you know, they stoned him to death. But I believe when, Peter, when the Apostle Paul gives his testimony later in Acts, he credits that message with his salvation. So it was effective, wasn't it? And of course, all you have to do is go to the 8th chapter and uh, see how Philip preached the gospel. You see, he was reading. Well, let's just see how Peter preached it. I mean, uh, Philip preached it in Acts chapter 8, verse 30. And Philip ran there to him and heard him read the prophet Isaiah and said, Understandest thou what thou readest? And he said, How can I accept some man should guide me? And he besought Philip that he would come up and sit with him. The place of the scriptures which he read was this. He's going to read something that's according to the scriptures now. He was led as a sheep to the slaughter, and like a lamb dumb before his shearers, so he opened out his mouth, and his humiliation. In his humiliation his judgment was taken away, and who shall declare his generation, for his life is taken from the earth? And the eunuch answered Philip, and said, I pray thee, of whom speaketh the prophet this, of himself or some other man? Then Philip opened his mouth and began at the same scripture and preached unto him Jesus. Now, the reason you can preach Jesus from, this is all from Isaiah 53, isn't it? The reason that you can preach the gospel from Isaiah 53, because it tells of the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. It tells of his death, burial, and resurrection in, uh, in Isaiah chapter 53. And it tells it 700 years before it happened. And I don't know of any better place uh, to, to preach the gospel from because it told how it was going to happen 700 years before it happened. It meets all the proper criteria. And this man believed and he was saved. Well, we could go on through the gospel. We could uh, find some uh, the whenever Paul preached the gospel to kings or whoever, he said, all of this happened according to the scriptures. That's what he emphasizes. That looks like that we ought to get the point, doesn't it? And as I say, we don't have to look up all of the scriptures and make a, bi a person a Bible student. All we have to do is to say, look, you know, God had a plan. And God told it in detail before it ever happened. And when it happened, it happened exactly like God said it would happen. That is to say, God told how Christ would die, and that's the way he died. God told how he would be raised from the dead, and that's how he was raised from the dead. <coughs> you know, talking about tracks, People like tracks to run on. I, I, I find one here in Romans. I like pretty well. It, uh, it's not very complicated. Some people call it the Roman road. It's about six scriptures. You start out with Romans three ten, as it is written, there is none righteous, no not one. See, as it is written. Wonderful opportunity to say, God said that before you were ever born. He said you wouldn't be righteous. As it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. That's where you start. Next you go to 323. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. See how well that fits with the 310? None righteous, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And then you go to uh, 5. Eight, but, see, there's none righteous for all of sin. Five, eight, but God commendeth his love towards us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And 
And then uh, 6.23, Christ died for us, for the wages of sin is death. That's why he had to die for us, because the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Then you go to the 10th chapter of Romans, verse 9, that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. Doesn't mean that anything, does it? And then you want to make that practical? 10.13, For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Do you want to know whether you have faith or not? Do you want to know whether you believe? Do you want to know whether you believe that Christ is risen from the dead? If you would talk to him, you would believe that, he'd, that, he'd, uh, that he has risen from the dead. To speak to him is to believe that he is and that he hears. Well, let's speak to him. Let's speak to him. If we believe that he's God, that he's raised from the dead, if he's God, he's everywhere, he's here. If he's alive, he can hear you. So let's call upon him. Here's how we do that. God, I agree with you, I'm a sinner. You said all have sinned, and I agree with you, I'm a sinner. Uh, you said I needed a Savior. I agree with you, I need a Savior. You say Christ died for my sins then I want that for myself. It's just a matter of talk, agreeing with God and talking to God about your agreement with him. That's how you get saved. To agree with God and to talk to God about your agreement. I, I, I don't know when they're going to get a better track than that one. Uh, some of you I know add or subtract one or two of those verses. But these fit so beauty, beautifully for me. Romans 3.10, Romans 3.23, Romans 5.8, Romans 6.23, Romans 10.9, and Romans 10.13. Now, some of you, I know, use a few more verses, like you'd use 10.9 and 10. And uh, you'd use uh, 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 5, 5, is it? 5, uh, 6. Uh, for when we were yet without strength in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. That's a good one, of course, to bring in the fact that Christ, that God told about it beforehand. The time was due. Why was it due? Because God said it would happen. And the time came when God said it would happen. So it's a good uh, occasion to bring in the fact that it was said beforehand. But if you start with 310, you start with that. God has written, God has said certain things. One of the things he said is that none of us are righteous. And so he's told us beforehand how he's provided that for us. And then it's all happened just like he foretold it. And so, uh, now why does the book of Romans furnish such a good pattern? Well, we already told you. It's the book that explains the gospel to save people. It tells you why we needed in chapters 2 and 3. Chapter 2 tells us our predicament, uh, what we're like that would cause us to need it. Chapter 3 emphasizes our need. Uh, chapters 4 and 5 unfold to us uh, how we appropriate it. And right on down the line, you see, it explains the gospel, the book of Romans does. And it's written to save people, not to unsave people. The gospel is to be presented, proclaimed. The gospel, and when I say the gospel, I mean like God defines it, is to be proclaimed to the unsaved and it's to be explained carefully to save people. They need to understand it. They need to have it explained. That's why we take a lesson every now and then like this and make sure that... Uh, that we're not forgetting to uh, to explain the gospel to God's people. Well, we won't have to do it next week because I did everything I intended to do on that subject. So, 
We might uh, next week go through those scriptures uh, in uh, 1st, 2nd Samuel and 1st Kings that uh, helps, help us to understand uh, the typology uh, between David and, and Solomon and so forth. Let's pray. Father, we do thank you that you gave us a message that does have power for each one of us who saved have been the recipients, not only of the message, but of the power. And we pray, God, that uh, we would carefully deliver the same thing we received and not an imitation of some sort of that which we received and that by which we were saved. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.